You know, you'll talk to people today, even astrobiologists, and it's their position that there's absolutely no evidence for current life on Mars. How would you respond to that? They haven't done their homework. Barry DiGregorio is an astrobiologist, award-winning public speaker, journalist, musician, and published author. In 1967, he developed his love for music and journalism after hanging out with The Who backstage at Melody Fair in North Tonawanda, New York on their first U.S. tour. He later went on to interview people like Eric Clapton and Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad. As a science journalist, he's interviewed dozens of notable scientists and aerospace personnel, including Chuck Yeager, who first broke the sound barrier in 1947. He's also corresponded directly with Neil deGrasse Tyson, Carl Sagan, Arthur C. Clarke, Neil Armstrong, and William Shatner. In 1995, his proposal to look for hydrogen peroxide on Mars was one of five recommended for consideration by the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute. That same year, his music was literally brought into space on cassette tape and played on the Space Shuttle Discovery by NASA astronaut and first female space pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Eileen Marie Collins. He spent 10 years as a research associate for the Cardiff Center of Astrobiology at Cardiff University in Wales. In 2010, Di Gregorio was made Honorary Research Fellow for the Buckingham Center for Astrobiology in the United Kingdom. Since 2000, he has been the director and founder for the Planetary Protection Group, known as International Committee Against Mars Sample Return. He's authored three books on Mars, most notably one titled, Mars, The Living Planet. So when people think about Mars today, what do they think of? They think the planet's red. Anything else? Very little. So, would you say that Mars is different than our initial perception of it? Absolutely. It's a different planet today than it was 25 years ago. For centuries, we've, we wanted to know, is there life on Mars? And fortunately, in the mid-20th century, NASA sent some missions there to try to answer this question. And aboard this Viking mission were some experiments that were intended, that were designed to directly search for life. And in the wake of that mission, what was the take home message that NASA wanted everyone to understand? That it searched, but found no evidence for microbial life on Mars. Since then, has the data supported that? No, just the opposite. But you gotta understand, the only reason in 1976 that they said that there was no life on Mars, no organic molecules, that was it. That was the criteria. So NASA sent two Viking landers to Mars in 1976. Yes. What did it find? Well, there were controversial findings. Some of the experiments, the biology, biology experiments in particular, each got different reactions that uh, the science teams thought were either indicative of uh, life on Mars or uh, chemical oxidants. Any astrobiologist today who doesn't know anything about the labeled release experiment is not an astrobiologist at all. I mean, that's part of history. What is the labeled release experiment? The labeled release experiment was uh, a microbial metabolism experiment that was tested many times under many different conditions on Earth, and in each instance found living microbes uh, everywhere it, it searched before it went to Mars. It was a test designed by whom? Uh, Dr. Gilbert V. Levin. Uh, he was a scientist that worked with the uh, municipal water systems and you know, every time his experiment was used to look for, for contaminants in the water, it uh, showed remarkable swiftness at spotting any kind of contaminant. So he decided to uh, pitch his experiment to uh, 
Dr. Keith Glennon, uh, NASA's first administrator, at a Washington cocktail party where he successfully uh, talked to Glennon and uh, Glennon had said, please, by all means, submit a, a proposal. We're going to be sending an experimental uh, craft there and uh, we're, we're looking for life detection experiments. So NASA was looking for ways of detecting life on Mars because that's where they were headed next. That's right. And they were looking for proposals? Correct. And you're saying that Gil Levin independently developed this labeled release experiment on his own and then pitched this idea to, at a cocktail party to a NASA representative? Yeah, Keith Glennon, the first Keith NASA okay. administrator. And, first NASA administrator. And uh, He was receptive to it? He was receptive, and uh, within a few months he was working on a, a version that would fly to Mars. Why do you think NASA accepted his experiment for the Viking mission? Because he, he was able to demonstrate its uh, viability in detecting living microorganisms on Earth in uh, all different types of extreme environments. So it, it seemed like if you could detect metabolism on Mars, that would be certainly uh, one of the ways to say you found life on Mars. Well, how do we know that this test worked? Well, Levin and all the people associated with Viking uh, were giving uh, different types of soils, soils from Antarctica, soils from the Himalayan mountains, just uh, anywhere where life could be harsh for uh, microorganisms to, to take hold. It was thought that uh, the Martian environment would be much harsher. So if uh, the experiment that they picked to go to Mars wasn't able to detect uh, some of the hardiest microbes on Earth, then it would be useless. You're saying it tested samples from... All over the Earth, yes. Yeah. It could detect as few as 10 uh, living organisms in a sample of soil, small sample of soil. So extremely sensitive. So NASA felt confident that they could rely upon this to perform the same experiment, the same test on Mars. That's correct. This labeled release experiment was uh, designed by Dr. Gil Levin, and it was also, um, he had help from someone else to adapt it for, for Viking, is that right? Yeah, Dr. Patricia Ann Strett. Right, and what was her uh, involvement with the program? She was to develop the instrument for the uh, trip to Mars. So she adapted what he had independently uh, designed right. outside of the NASA environment. She helped him adapt it for the, the NASA mission. Yeah, there was only so much space available for each biology experiment and the uh, gas chromatographs, mass spectrometer. So they all had to fit into uh, a space about the size of a, of a small toaster oven. Dr. Gil Levin had help from Patricia Anstrat mm -hmm. to adapt the labeled release experiment for the Viking mission. Correct. Okay, they sent it to Mars, and as I understand it, they sent two of them to uh, different locations, thousands of miles apart. Yep. And both labeled release experiments tested positive when testing the soil for active microbial metabolism. Correct. Okay. So do you think that uh, Dr. Gil Levin and Dr. Strat, do you think they felt confident in their results to, uh, to conclude that they found life on Mars? Absolutely, yes. Uh, but what happened? NASA kept coming up with different theories of what could have caused the reaction besides life. How were their results received by the scientific community? They were heretics. It was very clear that NASA wanted them to leave it alone. And when Gill was 
invited to the 1986 NASA Symposium for Viking, the 10 years that had passed since then. Uh, he stood up and stood his ground and said, you know, it is more likely than not that the labeled release experiment detected living organisms in the soil of Mars. Okay, and we, we saw what happened at that conference. And what happened at the conference? He was uh, basically uh, verbally attacked, uh, threatened. Threatened? Uh, th threatened, yes. Threatened with removal. Removal? Yeah. He was also called a non-scientist and that he should be ashamed of himself. And uh, one of his peers, who also had an experiment, the pyrolytic release experiment, actually went up to Gill and told Gill to his face that he would gladly eat Mars soil to prove him wrong. Jesus. Okay, so... What the hell's wrong with these people? Okay, so after that, uh, Gill and Pat Stratt uh, avoided conference proceedings for a long time. So they, they, their results were not well received by the community. Not well received, but he continued to work on all the, all the theories that NASA put forth against the label release experiment. He, he continued the work. Mm -hmm. They knew that their experiment was, had good data. And so they were pretty solid on it. They were solid, yes. But because NASA, that, that institution carries weight. Anything that they say, essentially, if you're not in agreement with that, then, then what? Then you're off the team, essentially. Uh, Pat Stratt went to work for the National Institute of Health. Uh, Gill conti continued work at his Biospherics Incorporated company, developing other different uh, things like... Uh, artificial sweeteners and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But he still kept, uh, you know, publishing a paper or two every now and then, uh, disputing any sort of uh, NASA new oxidant theory. And so Dr. Gillivan developed this labeled release experiment. NASA said, yep, let's put it on Viking. Because we want to use this test to see if there's any life on Mars. And it worked by detecting metabolism? Microbial metabolism, right. Okay, so how did it detect microbial metabolism? The labeled release experiment took a small sample of Martian soil and added a drop of nutrient solution to it feeding a microbe food and watching the gas coming out of the soil that has the food in it. And that can be measured inside the labeled release experiment very precisely. So you're feeding microbes? Feeding microbes nutrients and measuring their gas coming out. You measure the gas that comes out of microbes? Yes. Something eats, some farts come out. Right. That's the gas. And that's how this experiment worked. Exactly. That sounds pretty easy. And it had a control on it, too. You could alter the temperature inside the test cell. So in other words, to differentiate from life, uh, you could, for example, heat the inside of the test cell to a temperature, say, 160 degrees Celsius, and then run the test with the nutrient solution. And, of course, if you didn't get a response, uh, that would indicate that either all the uh, organisms were killed when you brought the temperature up to 160 degrees, or, uh, you know, there was some other mechanism at play that didn't allow their appearance. So you're saying just to make sure that they weren't getting a false result, they were in a control, which is basically they, they took the same, or they took a different sample of soil. Yes. And they heated it. Why'd they heat it? Yep. 
What's the purpose of heating it? To kill the microbes. So if there were microbes in the soil, they'd heat it to kill everything that's in there. And then apply the nutrients. Solution. And then feed it. Right. And if it didn't produce, uh, if it didn't detect it. The gas. The gas. If there was no gas that came out of that, then they could say, well, we killed the microbes. So there shouldn't be any gas. Correct. Okay, so they did the control, and was that basically the, the result they were expecting? Yeah, it was. And uh, the control could be altered even further. They found that they can lower the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius in the, uh, in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And when they did that, they applied uh, the solution nutrient solution to a small sample that had been uh, exposed to 50 degrees Celsius for three hours, and they noticed that there was a slight reaction. So you're saying they didn't heat it as much, right? which basically that, that, that potentially means they killed some but not all of the living microbes. Correct. And it got a partial positive result. That's right. Okay. So that's yet another indicator you're saying of that right. what we were seeing is the result of active microbial metabolism. Yes. Okay. So case closed. No, not case <laughs> closed. Why not? Because there was another experiment on board, which was called the Viking GCMS. And this the Viking what? GCMS. GCMS? What's that mean? Gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Yeah, which is an instrument that is used to detect organic molecules. So this test was looking for organic molecules in the soil. Exactly. And that's different from life how? Well, organic... Is that looking for life too? Not, no, because organic molecules are the dead bodies, basically. Okay, so, so it's looking for, what, what is organic molecules? Like, what does that mean to people? Dead, dead bodies, what does that mean? It means the stuff of life. Like if you're talking about if, if a leaf falls down and it turns brown. Right. Okay, and it crumbles up, it's not living anymore. Right. But that's still organic. Yes. Material? You can still detect the organic material, of course. And there's organic material in soil? Yes. Okay, so this test was looking for organic material, while the labeled release experiment was looking for microbial metabolism. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so the, what did the organic material test find? It found that there was no organics in the soil. It didn't find them? Right. Okay, so what's that mean? So what? Uh, well, they, the scientists at the time on the Viking team thought that the, the weight of the finding of the GCMS outweighed what the Viking labeled release experiment found because they stated that without the bodies, there's no way that you can have any sort of life on Mars. You're saying without organic material in the soil, the dead bodies. Then how can you have living microbes in the soil without organic matter? Exactly. Okay, so NASA's, when, when NASA was trying to explain what they found, what did they say? They said that was the ball game. They said no organic molecules on Mars, no life. And the case was closed against the uh, Viking labeled the release experiment data, which Gill uh, would go on to argue in scientific journals and conventions <clears throat> for the next 45 years, saying that he had evidence that the Viking uh, organic analysis instrument was defective. He found that in early tests of uh, his experiment with an Antarctic soil, that that soil was also given to the GCMS team, the organic analysis team, uh, 
prior to it flying to Mars. And Gill's experiment readily found microbial metabolism taking place in that sample. Yet, this uh, sample uh, placed in the organic analysis instrument uh, did not find any evidence for the dead bodies. They sent both of these tests down to Antarctica before they sent them to Mars? No, uh, they took samples from Antarctica and sent them to their laboratories for, for testing. Okay, and so the samples found that there was life in, microbial life in Antarctic soil, but the GCMS test did not find organic matter in the soil of Antarctica. That's correct. It was, what, is there organic matter in the soil of Antarctica? Absolutely there is, yes. So before NASA sent the labeled release experiment and the GCMS organics test to Mars, they needed to ensure that these things worked here on Earth. So they tested them, right? Correct. They, you need to test these things before you send it to Mars. Absolutely. Right? And so they, they tested, what was the track record for the labeled release experiment? Flawless. Flawless. Never made a false positive. Okay, so they got soil samples from Antarctica, labeled Reese experiment. What did it find? Found plenty of life in Antarctic soils. Okay, what in the GCMS? Uh, it was an ill response. There was uh, no organics detected whatsoever. Okay, are there organics in the Antarctic soil? Absolutely. But the GCMS didn't find them. Right. But they still sent it to Mars. That's the problem, is they still sent it to Mars. And that's why did they send it to Mars? You know, some claim that the $55 million uh, organic analysis instrument should have never been flown. And Gill offered that evidence in a scientific journal, and it was apparently not accepted for whatever reason. You're saying that Gillivan knew that the GCMS test wasn't any good? Correct. And that he tried to warn people? Yes. NASA leadership? Absolutely. To say, hey, look, you're going to send a faulty test to Mars. That's right. And they sent it anyway? Correct. Okay. It didn't find organics on Mars? Correct. Yet NASA concludes based on the GCMS test result being negative, that because there's no organics in the soil, because it didn't find any, because it wasn't sensitive enough, that that overrides the labeled release experiment data. That's correct, and it goes even beyond that, because the pyrolytic release experiment. What's that? That was the experiment that would take uh, a scoop of soil and humidify it with no nutrient solution and expose it with a xenon lamp to see if any organic molecules would form from that. Mm -hmm. And inside the test chamber, seven out of nine pyrolytic release experiments found organic material forming in minute quantities. So this is a third test? Yeah. That basically uh, questioned the, the <coughs> organic analysis instrument. Because its, its results were suggesting that there were organic material, that there Correct. was organic material, material yes. in the soil. That's <clears throat> right. Correct. Okay. So uh, fast forward many years later, have we, uh, have we looked for organics again? <laughs> yes. Did we find them? Yes, in droves, in the atmosphere, rocks, and soil. So we have found organics on Mars. Yeah, yes. Is it conclusive? Conclusive. Okay, so that means there's life on Mars. Well, it's not that easy, is it? <laughs> Why not? Well, because, first of all, there's a number of uh, people that uh, don't want to accept the fact that there is life on Mars because it could complicate the vision of what they want to do. Like, for example, there's a lot of talk about sending humans to Mars. 
Well, okay, what about that? How does that, how does life on Mars affect a mission, a human mission to Mars? Well, if your astronaut's good at Mars, and there's something in the soil, and it kills you, uh, that's the end of your program. So astronaut safety. A astronaut safety, correct. So, so you're saying the, uh, they haven't revisited the 76 results? Right. And re reanalyze them and said, well, since we found organics, and since we know that there are organics in Mars, in the Mars soil right now, that maybe that the results weren't so as inconclusive as they once thought. Correct. When did they find organics? With Curiosity. Curiosity rover? Yes. Okay. So they found organics in, on Mars, yep. which it, had they found organics in 1976, do you think they still would have said, well, the life test results are inconclusive? No. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think they don't want to revisit these results? Because it complicates matters in, in, in future programs that they have on the table right now, like human missions to Mars, which are funded in the billions of dollars and uh, are very popular in our culture uh, as the next goal for mankind to uh, at least reach and... So we're, we're gonna send, we're about to send humans to Mars. That's our next goal. Right. Right. And the possibility that there is active microbial life on Mars right now that presents a problem for this colonization It effort. does. They don't want to stop the funding, basically. That's basically it. They don't want to stop the funding. For the manned exploration initiative. Because if this question, you're saying that the, 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 the acceptance of microbial life on Mars could possibly stop future missions, manned missions to Mars. Absolutely, that's, that's it exactly. Because we don't know what it is that caused the reaction in Gill's experiment yet. No one has sent another life detection experiment to Mars to find out. Well, uh, why they haven't sent another life, why didn't they send another life detection? If, if things were an inconclusive, why didn't they just send another one? It's a good question. So, so it's, that was almost 50 years ago. Yes. They've had 50 years to send another life detection experiment and they have not done so. Gil Levin has tried many times to propose other experiments uh, that would basically uh, solve the problem that NASA seemed to suggest, and uh, each time any of his efforts were rejected. So if, if NASA interpreted the life test results overall to be inconclusive, how do they explain the labeled release experiment? How do they explain Dr. Gil Levin's experiment? Why would it achieve a positive result? if it wasn't for microbial, act, microbial activity. What does NASA say about that? They avoid it. They avoid it? They avoid it completely. What else could possibly produce that result, according to NASA? Oxidants, chemicals in the soil. A chemical reaction? Yeah. Okay, well, couldn't it be just a chemical reaction? No, because Gill spent the last 45 years of his life showing every possible chemical oxidant idea or theory. He put it to the test, put it to his experiment, and he said none of them worked. So he basically spent over 40 years, you say, trying to disprove this idea that it was simply a chemical reaction. Correct. If someone today were to tell you, Barry, there's no evidence for life on Mars, what would you say? They're wrong. There is evidence. What evidence is there? The evidence is apparent in all the literature. Uh, evidence from the Viking labeled release experiment, okay, uh, which covers a 45 year period or so. 
uh, evidence from the Curiosity rover, which shows that there's organic molecules in the rocks, atmosphere, and uh, soil of Mars, including seasonal fluctuations of methane produced possibly by microorganisms during uh, seasonal warming areas. Uh, oxygen has been detected in Gale Crater as well, coming out of the soil. You know, if you move on over to things like chlorophyll, even, even spots of chlorophyll have been detected on the Mars Pathfinder rocks. So for any astrobiologist to deny these things is a person that is saying that he doesn't understand what there is in the first place. And uh, probably the things that uh, matter the most right now are the manganese oxide coatings that they're finding in Gale Crater on the rocks. Uh, manganese oxide coatings on Earth, otherwise known as rock varnish, are created by microbial life. That and Gil Levin's original assertion that he found uh, colored spots on rocks changing over time uh, seems to indicate that there's a lot of things going on with life on Mars. So here you have a whole long list of different things that you can, uh, you know, surmise lead to the idea that current life on Mars could still exist. What do you say to the person who says, well, you know, NASA is continuing to look for signs of life on Mars right now? I say they're not. They don't have any instrumentation uh, to look for life on Mars right now. They, they may say that they're looking for ancient evidence of life on Mars, but they're, they're certainly not looking for extant life. NASA tells us all the time they're looking for, they, they continue to look for life on Mars. No, they tell us that they're looking for evidence of ancient life on Mars. But they say we're looking for signs of life, don't they? Yeah, in, the, in, in ancient rock samples. So they're not looking for it currently? Exactly. Why? Uh, the instrumentation up to this point uh, hasn't been put on the spacecraft sent there for the last 20, 30 years. We send stuff there all the time. You're saying that they haven't sent the right tools there to look for life? Correct. Barry, what's the most important thing for people to understand about the way NASA sterilizes the rovers they send to Mars? That it's not good enough. It's not good enough? That's right. Why? <laughs> it shits. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's NASA. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Because they're sending unsterilized rovers to Mars. Oh, come on. NASA always sterilizes stuff. Do they? That's what they say. Or do they rubber stamp it? They say they sterilize stuff. NASA has lowered the standards for sterilization so that any spacecraft with a certain amount of microbial contamination can fly there. Is that how it always was? The Viking was heat sterilized before it left for Mars. They don't do that anymore. Viking was heat sterilized? Correct. Okay, so what does heat sterilizing mean? Heat sterilization is when you take the entire spacecraft and you bake it in an oven for a certain period of time at a certain temperature to be certain that the microbial stowaways, if there are any left, would be killed. And they don't do this anymore? No. Why? Because it's too expensive and they've decided not to look for life anymore. If you're not looking for life, you don't have to sterilize the spacecraft anymore. You know, meanwhile, we'll progress with our program and uh, we'll go looking for traces of ancient water on Mars. That was the next big step. They didn't want to look for current water on Mars. They wanted to know what kind of rocks were in the, the river channels and stuff like that. Couldn't they say, well, we're not looking for life on Mars because there's no water there? They could say it, but it would be lying. <laughs> there's water on Mars? Yes, absolutely. Where? All over the planet, under the soil, a few centimeters as H2O ice. Never mind those polar ice caps and stuff and the snow that uh, Viking found. Let's, 
let's look for ancient water. Does that make sense to you? That's what NASA switched over to. So Barry, you've done some other research with regard to these rocks that have these holes that appear to have been bored into them. Tell me about those rocks. The holes could be representative of life, ancient marine life. How so? We have examples of them on Earth, and we have examples of them at a former site on Mars now considered to be an ancient ocean basin. Okay, so what marine life makes these holes? Marine organisms burrowing through uh, sediments and uh, leaving their imprints in, in the rocks as they solidified. So we see rocks like that here on Earth? Yeah. And when we study them, we can tell that animals in the past, marine animals, have burrowed their way through and created these cavities? Yeah, in many cases, yes. So one could argue that this is perhaps another piece of evidence for at least ancient life on Mars. Correct. So why are you against the Mars sample return? Because it's dangerous to bring samples back from Mars that haven't been examined first on the planet itself. Because of the expense of the Mars sample return program being over budget by $11 billion, NASA has decided to uh, seek out contracts from individual space companies to see if they can bring it back on the cheap. Okay, so what? Dangerous proposition. Why? Could be bringing back deadly pathogens. Well, how would you sterilize a giant spacecraft like uh, Elon Musk's Starship, which is huge? You're going to sterilize that, put it down on Mars, and then bring it filled with soil back to Earth? It's ludicrous. It's insane. And Barry, you came across some redacted whistleblower documents. Right. From a NASA employee. Yes. Basically trying to sound the alarm that NASA, through this Mars sample return, could be doing just as you outlined for us, bringing back deadly pathogenic disease. Correct. This is an employee of NASA? Was a former NASA planetary protection officer. Okay, and what is a planetary protection officer? It's a person that is in charge of making sure the spacecraft meets all the requirements for sterilization for forward and back can contamination. Was this person aware of all the evidence for life on Mars? Yes. Which is why they uh, were... Removed. <clears throat> Which is why they filed this whistleblower complaint? Yes. Because there is serious concern that we could potentially bring back something that is alive. Yeah, a copy of that report was sent to the President of the United States. Was there any response? Not yet. Is that a problem? The word that I got from the whistleblower was it was space exploration idiocy. This is the continuing series of Blue Planet Red, an award-winning documentary film on the history, evidence for life, and catastrophes that contributed to the death of Mars. The documentary includes interviews with NASA's lead astrobiologist, university professors, aerospace industry scientists, and independent researchers. If Mars was like Earth in the distant past, could there still be life there now? What happened to it? And what turned a blue planet red? Oh, 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 oh,